Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And as you can see today, we wish to study God's moral law. We've been talking about God's moral law. This is the sixth uh, sermon that we've been giving on God's law. And in those other sermons, we um, very quickly, I might uh, show you what we've looked at. We, we looked at a verse in Romans chapter 2, verse 13. I didn't put the book there, but that's Romans, that the doers of the law will be justified. And what we saw in that passage is that um, it, uh, there's many other times that Paul says the exact opposite. He says in many other books, in fact, in one verse, he says three times, we will not be justified by obeying the law. The very opposite of what he says here. And he says the opposite of, he's only says uh, said this one time, but he says the opposite of it many times. In this in context, he says, no one will be justified by obeying the law. So justified means to be made right, to have a right standing in God's uh, sight. So we saw that what Paul is actually teaching is that this is the way people will be judged. You're going to be judged on whether you keep the law or not. But as he says in this context, nobody's ever done it. So in other words, this is really bad news. And what this does is it makes people realize they need a savior because they can't keep God's law. And then in the second sermon, we talked about the next couple of verses there in Romans chapter two, that we saw that everyone is going to be judged by those requirements because even if they've never read the Bible, they still have the requirements of God's law written on their hearts. People know it's wrong to murder. People know it's wrong to steal. People know it's wrong to lie. All of these things, even if they've never read God's word. So we uh, saw that um, even if people don't hear the gospel, they're going to be judged because they know that they've sinned. And this is one of the reasons why we want to get the gospel out to people, because they need the gospel. They're going to be judged by the gospel. And then in our third lesson, we saw that the law actually increases our sin. And that's like, wow, why would God give us the law if it makes us sin more and more? Well, what it does actually is it increases our knowledge of sin. Paul would say in uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 7, he said, I wouldn't have known what sin was except through the law. And he says, I wouldn't have known what it meant, do not lust or do not covet, if the law had not said do not covet. So you see, the law increases our knowledge of sin, and it also so it cre increases our responsibility toward God's law. Before people have the law, they still know the requirements of, of the law, God's moral law. They know it's wrong to do these things. But when they have the law, then they know for sure that <laughs> I'm breaking God's law. And um, I need help because I'm not keeping God's law. And then, then in the fourth lesson, we saw we're not under law, you see. But we're, that doesn't mean we're not under anything uh, in a way. Paul says we're not under law in Romans 6. So people say, well, why do we need the law? Well, he explains we died to God's law, and but we, we don't remain unmarried. You see, Mrs. Williams' husband dies and she remarries. Well, she's not an adulteress because death severs even the closest relationship on, on earth, and that's marriage. Well, the same applies to God's law. We died, he says in Romans 7, verses 1 through 6. We died to the law through the body of Christ. And then um, uh, we saw in chapter, uh, the fifth uh, sermon that we still struggle with sin. Paul points that out in uh, Romans chapter, five, uh, chapter 7, the last part of chapter 7. Even though we're believers, even though we're no longer under the law, we're not under the curse of the law, we still struggle with sin. And so today what I want to do is I want to look at uh, verses in God's word in the New Testament to show that this law that we're talking about time and again is a reference to the Ten Commandments. We, we call them ethical demands. They're the ethical demands 
That's what God is talking about over and over again when he talks about his law. And I want to talk about those and show you why it's very important. The first one I want to talk about is found in Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. Paul makes quite a few references to the law, God's law in Romans chapter 8. And so let's just see what he says here in verses 3 and 4. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to condemn uh, to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the spirit, but according, uh, according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now, Paul has made several references to God's law, and he uh, specifically has um, referred to God's moral laws or ethical demands, the ethical moral dimensions of God's law and that we find in the law of Moses in the Ten Commandments. For example, in Romans chapter 2, verses uh, 21 and 22, he equates God's law with the commandments, do not steal and do not commit adultery. And then he goes on to say that, let's say a non-Jew keeps the law, these two examples he gave, don't steal, don't commit adultery, and yet is not circumcised. And then he gives the flip of that. He says, um, let's say there's a Jew that is circumcised, but he doesn't keep the law. Well, what law is he referring to? Well, he just told us he's referring to these, the law that that says don't steal, don't commit adultery. And then he says in chapter 3, verse 20, he says, it's by the law that we become conscious of sin. You see, we know what sin is. That has to do with the moral law. And in chapter 7, uh, verse, verse um, 7, he says that the law is good, it's holy, and it's righteous. And there's a verse I was reading it this morning that really uh, struck me here in um, Romans chapter 7. And I want to just take time to read it because it's really, it really, uh, you know, some verses will really kind of strike you and hit you. And this one really did this morning to me when I was reading this passage. He says, um, In verse 11, for sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment, put me to death. Um, and he said, I would not have known what coveting was in verse 7, had it not been for the law. What is interesting about that uh, to me this morning was that it's through the law that we became dead to the law. So the law couldn't do something. He says here in chapter eight, verses three and four, he says what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. Now, what does he mean by that? The law, he's already told us in the previous chapter is good. It's holy and it's righteous. But he said the law couldn't do something. What? He says it was powerless to do something. And for what reason? He says it was weakened by the flesh. Now, what is he talking about by the flesh, weakened by the flesh? Well, he's talking about our sinful nature. He's talking about our sinful state outside of Christ. You see, out, outside of Christ, before we become believers, we're what? Paul and the New Testament writers many times would refer to as the flesh, meaning this unregenerate person. That's what we are. We have a propensity to sin. And it's because of this propensity to sin that we cannot fulfill the demands of the law because he says the law was powerless. It's not the fault of the moral law of God. It's the fault of our, our sinful nature. So look what he says here in in um, verses seven and eight, the sinful mind, you see this flesh, some translations will say flesh, 
Some will say sinful nature. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. I want you to, that's a powerful couple of verses there. What's he saying? He says, before we become believers, when we're outside of Christ, before we become regenerate, uh, um, he says, and, and born again, he says, we're hostile to God. We do not submit to God's law, and we can't do it, he says. He says we're controlled by our sinful nature. We cannot please God. Of course, if we're not keeping his law, how could we please God? That's a powerful passage right there. But Paul says in this passage in Romans 8, this is no longer the case with a believer. Because of the work of Jesus Christ and because of the work of the Holy Spirit in us, this isn't the case for believers anymore. So listen again now to verses three and four. It shouldn't say 34, it should say three and four. For what the law, it's good, it's righteous, it's holy, was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh that can't please God, is hostile to God and his word. God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. I want to tell you again, I say this and I don't get tired of saying this. Anytime you see a verb like that has to do with our salvation, the word save or reconcile or redeem or justify, anytime you see these verbs and they're in the active tense, God is always the subject of these verbs. God does it. God justifies. God reconciles. God redeems. God saves. Now, now, you know, if it's in the active tense, that means the subject is doing the action. If I say John hit the ball, hit is the action. John is the subject doing the action of the verb, and the ball is receiving the action. But if I make that a passive a uh, tense verb, then the ball becomes the subject. The ball was hit by John. Now the subject is the ball, and the at, and the tense of the verb is passive. Anytime you see the a verb that has to do with our salvation, and when it's in the active tense, God is doing the action, and we're receiving the action. Anytime that verb is put in the passive tense, like, then it's us. We are the subject of the sentence. We have been justified by grace, by God. And, and what do you see here? God did. We couldn't do it. But God did it by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He became man to be a sin offering and so he condemns sin in the flesh, he goes on to say, in order that, why did, why did God send Jesus to die for us to condemn sin in the flesh? He's going to tell us the reason why. He says, in order that we should have nothing more to do with God's law. Is that what Paul says right there? No, he says the exact opposite. He says, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live any longer according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. In other words, the purpose and the result of Christ's work in us is not only for our justification, but for our sanctification. In other words, justification has to do with being right with God sanctification is our holy living after we we are saved initially justified and we receive the holy spirit you see the work of christ and the work of the holy spirit in us is described in terms of god's laws requirements being fulfilled in us in terms of the way we live he says we don't live anymore according to the flesh we live according to the spirit 
So this is why Christ has redeemed us, saved us, reconciled us, justified us. It's not so that we couldn't have, we don't have anything to do with the law anymore, but it's so that we might be obey the righteous requirements of the law. You see, that's why he tells us that we've been saved and we're being sanctified and being led by the Holy Spirit. So as the Holy Spirit lives within us, we increasingly do this. I want to read now. Go back and read this whole section, verses uh, five through nine, and just look at this contrast being made between someone who's saved, a regenerate man, and someone who's unregenerate. They've never been saved or renewed. Listen to what Paul says. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set upon what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set upon what the Spirit desires. See this contrast? The mind of the sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. And then our uh, verses we read earlier, the sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. It's impossible. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. They're controlled by something else, but it's not by God. They're, they cannot please God. You, however, look at the contrast, are not controlled by the sinful nature, but by the spirit, if the spirit of God lives in you. And he's not saying if that happens, you, you know, if you're a Christian, and if it happens, he means when it happens, basically. Because you're not a believer, you're not a Christian unless the Holy Spirit lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not believe, belong to Christ. And then he says, verse uh, 9, you are not controlled by the sinful nature, but you are controlled by the Spirit. Now, this is really interesting because the same apostle who's told us in Romans that we are free from forever from the law as a means of gaining acceptance to God, that we're free from ever, forever from its curse for us, upon us because of our sin. He also teaches in this one of the purposes in this very same letter of the law is that we've been freed so that we might be enabled by the Holy Spirit to obey that same law. You see, the law of God is not cast aside like an old, old enemy that we have that has nothing to do with us anymore. But now we embrace it as our friend by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this hostility that we had in our hearts now is subdued. And we're enabled more and more to fulfill the law's requirements. And so this same law that he's talked about many times and equated many times with the Ten Commandments, here he says, uh, we don't leave those behind. I want to look at another passage, Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. Paul says, um, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. Now, I want to show you that in the New Testament, the underlying assumption over and over again is that believers are obligated to obey God's law meaning the Ten Commandments. So he says here, let no debt remain outstanding uh, except this debt to love one another. Why is it our duty to love one another? Well, he tells us whoever loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. What's the implication of that? It's our duty to fulfill the law. This is why we are to love one another, because our duty is to fulfill the law. And by loving one another, we will be doing that. We will be fulfilling the law. We need to be fulfilling the law as believers. And how do we do it? By loving one another. You see, Paul assumes that it is our duty as believers to fulfill the law, and it's, um, we're obligated to fulfill the law. And if we're not obligated to fulfill the law, what's the point of this statement right here? Well, it's meaningless. We need to be fulfilling the law, Paul says. But let's go on. He, he, he goes on in this passage, verse 9. 
The commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not cover, covet, and whatever other commandment there may be. Now, let me ask you something. He says, we fulfill the law by loving one another, verse 8, and then he gives some examples. Where did these commandments come from? Don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't covet. Where do these commandments come from? Well, they're the Ten Commandments. And it's true that he doesn't mention every single one of them by name, but he does mention all of them by that last statement. He says, what a, whatever other commandment there may be. Now, obviously, he's talking about the Ten Commandments, you see. And so what does he say about these commandments? Well, let's continue the latter part of verse 9. He says, they are all replaced in this one rule, love your neighbor as yourself. Is that what Paul said there? All these commandments, these 10 commandments that I've just, you know, given to you, they've all been replaced by the commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus Christ has come along. He's given us higher ethics than the Old Testament. And so now we don't, they, they're replaced by this commandment that Jesus gives us, love your neighbors yourself. He doesn't say that. He says the exact opposite. He, he doesn't say they're replaced. The Ten Commandments aren't replaced. They're summed up. They're summed up in this one commandment, love your neighbors yourself. By the way, where does that commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, come from? The law of Moses. In Leviticus 19, verse 18, we have this command, love your neighbors yourself. A lot of people don't know the Old Testament that I grew up with. You know, they, we used to uh, teach, you're not under the Ten Commandments. Well, that's just ridiculous. And you see, Jesus is giving a higher standard, you know, higher ethics than you find in the, Jesus isn't, he never says anything that's not already in the Old Testament. And let me give you an example of, of Jesus saying the same thing that Paul does here. Well, let's look at another passage of Paul's first, Galatians 5, 13 and 14. He says, you, my brothers, were called to be free. Do not use your freedom to indulge in the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is replaced in a single commandment that Jesus gives us now. Love your neighbors yourself. Is that what he said? No. He says the entire law is summed up again. Same thing as he said before. In a single command, love your neighbors yourself. And that command, love your neighbors yourself, is from the law of Moses. Jesus didn't say that for the first time in his ministry. Moses said that 1,500 years before Jesus. And so, but let me show you that Jesus says the same thing. Jesus said, Matthew 7, 12, so in everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. Now, let me ask you something. When God says to Moses, love your neighbor as yourself, and Jesus says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, is there any diff difference in those two statements? Not at all. That's exact same thing. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do the way you do to others, you, you do the, uh, to others as you would have them do to you. It's the same thing. And Jesus says the same thing. He says, this sums up the law and the prophets. You see, he says the same thing that Paul is saying here. He's not saying, now I'm coming up with a higher ethic. You know, they didn't have this before I came along. No, he's saying the same thing the Old Testament says. And again, I'll show you another passage where Jesus says it. This, you know, the two greatest commandments Jesus gives here in Matthew 22. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He said, this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. On all, all the law and the prophets are replaced by these two commandments. Does Jesus say those two commandments replace the law and the prophets? That's the way it's basically taught. No, Jesus says, 
they all hang on those two, those two commands. This first commandment, he said, the most important, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, that summarizes, even truncates further, the first of the ten, first four of the Ten Commandments. And then love your neighbors yourself summarizes the last six of the Ten Commandments. Jesus is just giving the Ten Commandments themselves are a summary of God's moral law. We're going to see beginning next week when we start looking at each one of these Ten Commandments. But he just summarizes them more. And he, in Matthew 7, 12, and Paul, in our text up here, and also Galatians 5, they summarize the Ten Commandments even more when they summarize it and, and quote from Leviticus 19, 18, love your neighbors yourself. So G Paul assumes, Jesus himself assumes the abiding relevant, uh, re relevance of the Ten Commandments in the lives of believers. All right, so these are, these are important, as you can see, in understanding God's law. I want to read another passage. There's about 25 passages I could go to. I'm only go, going to go to about four or five. This is the third one. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, Paul's, Paul wrote, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture is God-breathed. Another word for that is inspired, by the way. That's what the word inspired means, God-breathed. So what scripture is Paul specifically talking about here when he says all scripture? Well, he's talking about what we would call the Old Testament. And how do we know that? Because the New Testament hadn't been compiled yet. You see, the, the primary reference, now obviously the New Testament is inspired too, but when Paul wrote this, the primary reference in this context is the scripture that they had in their possession, which is the Old Testament. You see, he says it's inspired. It's still useful. Why is it useful, Paul? Well, he says to teach us. I grew up in a system where we basically, we never studied from the Old Testament, which is two thirds of God's revelation, because we said, well, we're not under the Old Testament. So let me explain something to you. You see, there's an old covenant that we're not under. We are under a new covenant, but that's not the same thing as the Old Testament. When we say the Old Testament, we're talking about 39 books. God revealing his mind to us in 39 books. That's not the same thing as the old covenant. The old covenant's been done away with, but nowhere we see in many passages does it even hint that the Old Testament is done away with. And yet a lot of people didn't understand this. And I used to say it, and I heard preachers and teachers say it many times, and they believed it. We're not under the Old Testament. Yeah, we are. It's God's word. Paul says it right here in the New Testament. By the way, Old Testament, New Testament, those are terms that are nowhere found in God's word. Those are terms that man has come up with to refer to 39 books and then 27 books. But yeah, we're under all of God's word, all of it. And so he says we can still use it to teach and rebuke and correct and train in righteousness. You see, notice there's this reference to the moral teachings of the Old Testament. We're still obligated to them. And that's what this passage, as well as the other two we mentioned, uh, says. All right, let me look at two other passages. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1, and 1 through 3. Paul says, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Now, Paul quotes the Ten Commandments here, specifically the Fifth Commandment. The Fifth Commandment in the Ten Commandments says, honor your father and your mother. 
You'll notice what Paul's not saying here. He doesn't give a long explanation and say, now I know we're not under the 10 commandments and they don't apply to us anymore, but this particular commandment does. He doesn't give any long explanation. You know, he doesn't try to qualify it in any way. You know what he does? He assumes its continued authority under the new covenant. You see, its abiding authority is taken for granted. And that's what we see throughout the Bible by Christ in the, some of the verses we quoted, but many others. We see it throughout the New Testament, all the writings to the churches. It's assumed that the ethical demands and dimensions of God's law summarized in the Ten Commandments are still vogue. And you'll notice that Paul quotes this fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother. He says it's the first commandment with a promise. Well, obviously, he's talking about the fifth commandment. The only place, by the way, this is found anywhere is the Ten Commandments, this honor your father and your mother. But the fifth commandment you can you, you see he's he's referring to is one of a series of commands in which this is the first one in that series with a promise. So again, what do we see? They assume the abiding authority of the Ten Commandments. He obviously, and the whole New Testament does this, by the way, and the Old Testament, clearly views the law as a whole unit of which this fifth commandment is just part of the unit. And it's assumed this, the, this abiding authority, this fifth uh, commandment is assumed. And it's assumed that the Christian community would know that that was still vogue. He doesn't quote the fifth commandment to make it binding. You know, that's what this group I grew up with used to teach. You know, God, if he quotes it in the New Testament, then it's okay. It's binding. No, he never, you never read that anywhere, by the way. The exact opposite. They quote the Old Testament ethical demands as if they're already binding. Now, it's true we're not under the ceremonial demands of God's law, you see. Those have been abolished. The New Testament clearly points that out, but nowhere is it even hinted at that the ethical demands of God's law have, has changed or Jesus has come along and given us this higher ethical teaching that wasn't found in the Old Testament. Jesus, when it comes to ethical teaching, doesn't ever say one thing that is not already found in the law of Moses in the Old Testament. And so um, we see that again in this passage. And then one other passage, James chapter 2, verses 8 through 13, James says, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. Again, where is that law found anyway? Well, in the law of Moses. You just see time and again, Jesus quoting it. People think, well, Jesus left a higher ethic. No, he's quoting the law of Moses. Paul, love your neighbors yourself. He's not showing the church some higher ethic. He's quoting the law of Moses. James, he's quoting the law of Moses. He's, they're all quoting Leviticus 19.18 from the law of Moses. But he says, if you... Keep this law, he says, verse 8, you're doing right. Verse 9, but if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Now, I, I want to ask you, what is this law that gives freedom? Some translations say that gives liberty, this law of liberty. He says here in this translation, the law that gives freedom. What is it anyway? Is it, is it a law? He says we're to act and speak, you know, in this way. Is it a law that says you can do anything you want to? You're free now to do anything you want to. Well, he makes, this, makes it very clear what law he's talking about. 
He says, it's the law that's summarized in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. And so if you, but now he, he um, that's a summary of it, but he tells us what he means exactly, what law he's talking about by quoting a couple of the Ten Commandments, doesn't he? He says, do not murder, do not commit adultery. Where are those found? They're found in the Ten Commandments. But he shows us again that it is a unit. You can't just keep the, this one law in the Ten Commandments and not keep another one. You see, they're, they're always viewed as a unit. And we can summarize them as Jesus did, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Or we can summarize them even more like Jesus did and Paul did and James is doing here. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because you can't love God and, and hate your neighbor. That's what James would say and John would say. And so um, we see, again, it is a unit. You can take, it's like, a chain that has 10 links in it. You're hanging over a cliff, a canyon, and you're hanging on by, you're being uh, held up by this chain that has 10 links in it. Now you can study each individual link of that chain. It, they're all unique in one sense, but that chain is not a chain with all, without all 10 of those links. You break one link in that chain and down you go into the canyon. And that's the way it is with God's law, the 10 commandments, summarized in the 10, ten commandments. They're, they were never intended to be separated. So he only mentions the sixth and seventh commandment, don't murder and don't commit adultery here. But you see, it applies to all the other commandments as well. And it also shows that this is just assumed that the church would know that these are abiding commandments. All right, let me conclude here. Man, there's a lot of things I could say about the importance of this uh, teaching today. But a lot of people don't understand that I grew up with. They don't understand we still are obligated to the Ten Commandments, that they're God's moral law. They've never changed. And as I go through these Ten Commandments, you're going to see we're going to flesh them out. A lot of people treat them like the Pharisees did. Don't commit murder just means don't kill somebody. We're going to see it means a lot more than that. And Jesus shows that in the Sermon on the Mount. You say, well, yeah, he was explaining, you know, a, a higher ethic. He didn't say one thing that couldn't be found in the Old Testament. When he said don't commit adultery, you said, you see what he's doing is he's quoting people you have heard it has been said by those ancient, well, he's talking about rabbis. They just made the law a literal command, don't kill somebody. But Jesus said, no, it, it goes deeper than that. And that's what we're going to see. But Jesus didn't say one thing new that wasn't found in the Old Testament. And by the way, all of those things that Jesus is contrasting his teaching with, that he just basically says the same thing that's found in the Old Testament. Not all of those things he's contrasting is even found in the Old Testament. The, the Old Testament never, never tells someone to hate their neighbor. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has never taught hatred. But they taught, the rabbis taught, that it'd be okay to, you know, hate your, you just have to love your neighbor, your literal neighbor fellow Jew is the way they interpreted it. And he, when he answers that, he quotes the Old Testament. He just gives the Old Testament. This very important. But here's one application that I want to make here. The preaching of the Ten Commandments is very important for evangelism. If you don't preach the law, that's not only bad for Christians, it's bad for the lost. Because one of the reasons, one of the means for bringing people to Christ is convicting people of their sin. You know, the greatest exposition by far in God's word of the gospel is Romans chapters one through five. And he spends almost the first three chapters talking about sin. Sin. 
the wrath of God on people because of sin. Why does Paul spend so much time convicting people of sin when he says, my theme is the gospel, which means good news? Because unless people understand that they are sinners, unless they come to this painful understanding of where they stand before God because of their sin, then the good news of the gospel won't mean much to them at all. That's why you can tell people good news and you can tell all the facts and it's really good news, but it doesn't seem good news to people because they don't see themselves as sinners, you see. And the same thing is true of the church. The church has to hear the law. We saw in our first passage, Romans 8, verses 3 and 4, we weren't saved so that we could just ignore the law. You see, he didn't say that we were saved in order that the requirements of the law are no longer necessary for a believer. No, so that we might increasingly fulfill the requirements of the law. That's why we're saved. It brings glory to God. Let me give you an illustration before I conclude. Let's suppose that I walk up to you and I say, you know what? You, you were given, there's a, there was a warrant out for your arrest, and you were given a $50,000 speeding ticket, speeding fine. But I've got good news for you. There was a person who saw that, you know, you were about to be fined $50,000 for this speeding fine. And uh, the warrant was about to be issued for your arrest. But a guy stepped up for you and you were going to be all over the news. They were going to put it on the news and everything. And then arrest you. But I've got good news for you. Did you know that there was a person who came and paid that speeding ticket that you owed? And, um, and now there's no warrant and it's not going to make the news and, and you are as if you've never uh, committed that crime. Well, I'm going to tell you something. You probably would be, you know, you would be, um, not only would you, it not bother you that you'd committed this crime, <clears throat> but you would probably even be mad at me for insinuating to you that you've done something so terrible that you owe a $50,000 fine when you don't think you've done anything, you see, to, to deserve a fine. So you see, you don't think you've done anything and you'd be mad at me for going around. If You'd probably go around and tell people, Jimmy thinks I've done something so bad that I, I should be fine. I should have been fined $50,000. You'd probably be upset with me. But what if I convinced you that there was this blind children's convention and the speed limit was 10 miles an hour, but you were clocked going 55 miles an hour through this, this zone. And there were 10 clear signs up saying, this is the speed limit, 10 miles an hour. You ignored them all the way through that zone and you went through that that 10 mile an hour zone with these children's lives endangered going at 55 miles an hour. And what if I really convinced you that you had done that? And what if I really convinced you that this was the law, that this kind of crime was going to, you had to pay $50,000 and you really believed that. Then if I told you, and it really happened, someone stepped up and paid that fine for you, and now there's no warrant for your arrest, you're not going to make the news, nothing. You would think that was really good news. Well, you see, that's the problem we have in preaching the gospel. You see, what a lot of people are trying to do is they're trying to tell people, now, Jesus, he saves you from your sins. You won't have to go to hell. You, you can live eternally with God. You know what? People look at you and think, I haven't done anything so bad God would send me to hell. They even get upset with this. But when you preach the law and when you show people, here's what God's law says. Can you see that this would be a sin? And can you see that now you deserve punishment for these sins? 
But I've got good news for you. Someone has come in and paid the penalty for your sins. Now, all of a sudden, it becomes good news. Whereas before, you look at me. If I just try to tell you Jesus died on the cross for your sins, you look at me with a blank look and maybe even get upset that I tell you that. That's why the Ten Commandments are important. I plan to show you, God willing, starting next week, that you have disobeyed every single one of the Ten Commandments. And as we preach through this, I think your heart is going to feel more and more grateful that you have a Savior. So, yeah, the Ten Commandments are important, and we see this throughout God's Word, don't we? There's not one time in God's Word where we see that we're not under the Ten Commandments anymore. We don't have to obey them anymore. Yeah, we do have to obey them. Now, we, we are free from the condemnation of the law because Christ has paid the penalty, and we have his righteousness. That's all true, but we still are obligated to uh, obey these moral laws. All right, God willing, we will take that subject up again next Lord's Day.